So we are in our final week, the last week of our question series. It has been a challenging, fun one. Every year we carve out a month sometime within the year for you to ask a question, and then we take a biblical look at the answer, and we are wrapping up with a lot of tough questions today. Uh, so I have a lot to throw out uh, at you. So I got to talk quick. You got to listen quick. Um, and so let's kick off with the disclaimer first. The disclaimer is, I am not going to be able to answer these questions as effectively as I want to because of time restraints. That is a reality. Uh, these, I could do a whole sermon on probably every single one of these questions. Uh, so please hear me that as we step in, if you find yourself getting frustrated, pulling away, um, use this as an opportunity not to push away, but to press in. Shoot me an email, uh, follow up with me, uh, let's grab lunch, let's grow closer to Jesus, not farther apart. Um, so uh, with that in mind, question number one is this. What does God say about marriage and divorce? What is the biblical view on someone who has been divorced and remarried? Is the new marriage an ongoing sin, and do some churches actually teach this? Uh, so first, I'm going to remove, remove uh, abuse from this conversation um, because if you are struggling in a marriage with abuse, mentally, physically, emotionally, sexually, um, any one of those types of abuse, please hear me first and foremost. We need to hear from you. We need you to talk to us. We need, uh, we want to listen and help. We want to be present in your life. If you're not comfortable with me, um, that is fine. We can get a lady to talk to. Men, if you uh, come to me, ladies come to me, we can get you help. If you are in a uh, marriage of abuse, we want you to grow in Jesus. Um, so this is a great question uh, to quickly answer kind of that last question because there's a bunch of questions. Yes, some churches do teach uh, that new marriages is an ongoing sin. Um, I'll address a little bit more of that um, as we go along. Um, but this becomes a very difficult and an emotional question. Um, in this room alone, we have singles. In this room alone, we have married. We have widowed. We have divorced and singled, divorced and remarried, divorced, remarried, and divorced again. This is a topic that touches all of us in different ways. So today I want to boldly speak into our lives, knowing that with time restraints, it may spark more questions. Again, I cannot stress this enough. Grab me after service. Shoot me an email. But I want to tackle this question from three areas. The first way I want to tackle it is, what does God desire? The second way I want to tackle it is, what does God tolerate? And then the third way I want to tackle this is the ramifications of those, toler um, those tolerations. Uh, so first, let's talk about what does God desire. Besides the salvation of our souls, God's main desire for his children is to be holy because he is holy. We see this in 1 Peter chapter 1. This means your marriage's main God-centered design is not to make you happy, but to make you holy. Both husband and wife uh, worshiping and glorifying him with their entire lives. God desires uh, for gospel-centered, healthy marriages. And he will give you the wisdom and the strength to accomplish God-centered marriages. This means you don't get to walk away because you're unhappy. God takes the covenant he made, you made with your spouse seriously. He even says in Malachi 2 that he hates divorce. God cares deeply about us and our marriages. So we should face our future weddings our potential divorces with wisdom, counsel, and a lot of prayer. On top of that, 
the Institute, just a worldly example, the Institute of Family Studies has said this. I found this interesting. A study found that two-thirds of unhappy adults who stayed together were happy five years later. They also found that those who divorced were no happier on average than those who stayed together. In other words, most people who are unhappily married end up happy if they stick together. Of course, this takes strong community. It takes self-awareness. It takes a willingness to change both from the wife and the husband to look more like Christ, seek forgiveness, and give forgiveness. So what does God desire? God's plan is God-centered marriages. What does God tolerate? There are passages of Scripture that appears that God tolerates a divorce. First, when a believer is married to an unbeliever. Side note, you should not date or be married to an unbeliever. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. But if you get saved after you get married your sp- and your spouse wants out, he is or she is an unbeliever, wants out because of your holy lifestyle, you're not bound to that marriage, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But hear me in this. Ultimately, what God desires is for you to win them over to the Lord by your godly quiet lifestyle. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 3. Divorce is tolerated, not ideal. We should pray over this drastically. And in the case a believer, uh, let, let's unpack this a little bit further. In any case, the believer doesn't get to choose divorce as an option if they're married to an unbeliever. The lost spouse gets to choose it as we see in first corinthians and you might be sitting here going well i'm a christ follower and now i'm married to an unbeliever and he's not very nice or she's not very nice and um i want out and go find someone who loves the lord and i would tell you um too bad in the end it's not about your happiness it's about you being a witness in the dark areas of your marriage so that your spouse doesn't die and go to hell We have marriages in this room right now where spouses stuck it out and now their spouse will be in heaven for all eternity because of it. And they would tell you it was worth it. I met with a couple just a few weeks ago who he just gave his life to Christ and she's like, it was worth it. The second area, the Pharisees try to trap Jesus and he gives his second tolerance, Matthew 19 says this, they said to him, why then does Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and divorce her? Jesus said to them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning, it was not this way. Now I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another commits adultery. Wicked hearts wanting wicked things. But Jesus states in this passage, morality seems to be yet another tolerance. Does this mean that just because an indiscretion happens, divorce should be automatic? No, of course not. God has redeemed many broken marriages, both caused by the husband and the wife. Again, just because they are tolerated doesn't give you an instant green light. And third thing, why? Because the ramifications of our actions. Does divorce, other than those two previously mentioned reasons, mean you're entering your next marriage in sin? The words of Jesus do appear to allude to that. Does it mean that you are currently in ongoing sin with inside your second, third, or fourth marriage? I believe the words of Jesus does not allude to that because he plainly calls it a marriage, not an affair or adultery. So what is my best interpretation of the passage that Jesus is laying out here? Divorce is extremely messy, ladies and gentlemen. It's extremely messy. 
And many people don't allow for the Lord to deal with their sin. They're quick to point fingers at their spouse's sin. They don't allow the Lord to deal with their sin, with their mistakes, with their baggage. And then they take that mess right into their next marriage. This is why 67% of second marriages end in divorce and 74% of third marriages end in divorce. Why? Because the foundation that marriage was built on is selfishness, not sacrifice. Now, not every marriage, not every second marriage, I can look around the room and I love you all and I know all of your stories. And I can look around the room and I know for many of you, this is your second marriage. Please hear me in this. I'm not saying everyone, but I am saying most of the time when second marriages happen, you walk into that marriage bitter, broken. I'm not going to be treated like I was before. And you put all of your wounds from your first marriage onto your second marriage. And what I would lovingly love to tell you in this is Jesus needs to heal you in this. So should you divorce divorce your current spouse? No. Even if it is your first, second, or tenth marriage. Here's my advice in this. The current marriage you are in, make it about your holiness and about your spouse's holiness over your happiness. This will take sacrifice. This will take pursuing Christ daily. I think when Jesus becomes the center of your marriage, and not the Christian cliche, let's be honest, many of us all say, we want Jesus to be the center of our marriage, and that's a wedding vow and all those different things, and he's not, right? Your own pride, your own selfishness becomes the center of your marriage. When you truly make Jesus the center of your marriage, you will drastically see improvements in your marriage and you will, and I truly believe this, watch the influence God gives you with inside your marriage and marriages around you. This is not an easy topic. I love you. This is very hard. I know these words that I am saying right now has maybe cut some of you today. Please hear me. This is not a time to push away. This is a time to press in and pursue Jesus even more in the midst of this and allow for God to grow us stronger in a community together. I do not have any more time to to unpack this question. I know you have a thousand more questions. Please press in. Don't press away. The next question I have for this is this. How can a child of God keep always the joy of the Lord in seasons of pain and suffering? Yet again, a wonderful, difficult question. First of all, if you find yourself in a season of pain and suffering, with all um, of my being as your pastor, please, I want to beg you to press into community And don't stop until that season of suffering has passed. It might not be your style. You may be the type who is a quiet sufferer. What I would ask for you to do is please don't rob yourself and please don't rob community from allowing God to use your pain. God wants to redeem this season of suffering. So don't waste it by becoming bitter Allow God to use it to be better. On top of this, I would encourage you to do some deep dives into Scripture in the midst of suffering and pain. I would encourage you the books of Psalms or maybe Philippians. These are amazing books about a weary heart. Listen to a few passages of Scripture found in Philippians. Remind yourself that as Paul wrote these words, he was in prison, potentially waiting his execution. Put that in the back of your mind when you hear these passages. Do all things without grumbling and questioning that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That is Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
That is Philippians 4, 4. I rejoice greatly that you have received uh, you have received your concern for me, and that you were concerned, but you have and you, but you had no opportunity. Not that I speak of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation that I am content. I know how to be abused, uh, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secrets of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Philippians 4, 10 through 13. Paul knew that his circumstances weren't dictate, or his circumstances don't dictate his joy. It was the confidence that he had and the sovereignty of God that creates his joy. One of my favorite verses, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, is the one I have tattooed on my arm, that God is the one who began this good work in you, and I am certain that he will not stop until it is complete, ladies and gentlemen. God is sovereign over our perseverance. If we're going to make it to the end, it will be because he caused us to make it to the end. How does joy within loss and heartache work? Because even though we have lost much, Christ comes and reveals himself as more valuable than anything we have lost. And how uh, when we have much and we're overflowing with abundance, Christ comes in and shows that he is far superior than anything we have. The secret of joy in the midst of the hardest times in your life is resting in the supremacy of Christ over all things. We spoke and spent the last 10 months talking about that concept as we went verse by verse through the book of Colossians. See, when you understand Christ is all you need, no matter how crazy it gets out there, ladies and gentlemen, you can thrive inside community because Christ is the center of your life. Let me give you a few practicals really quick for 30 seconds. Number one, don't suffer and grieve alone. Community, community, community. Number two, I would tell you this, uh, don't be fake about it. Christians are wonderful about being fake, right? Your world is collapsing and someone walks in and goes, how are you doing, brother? Oh, man, I am blessed and highly favored. Stop lying to us. Don't be fake about it. Press into community. Don't be fake. The third thing I would tell you in this is there is no shame in the counseling game. You need counseling. If you're going through the hardest time of your life, you need a professional counselor, Christian counselor, who can love you and walk you through it. Um, and then the fourth thing I would tell you, go for a walk, get outside, and delete your social media account for a season. So many times we suffer even more because we're looking at everyone's highlight reels and comparing it to our backstage. The backstage is a mess. Listen. You go behind this door, this backstage is a mess, ladies and gentlemen. And so many times what we do is we look at just the outside of everyone's life and we don't see the mess they're going through. I um, am corny. Uh, last night I was coming up with an acronym for this. How do you find joy in the midst of suffering? You cope. C-O-P-E. It's corny. Trust me, it's super corny. C-O-P-E. Number one, C, community. You need community. You need community. O, you need to be outdoors. You need to go for a walk. You need to get fresh air on you. You need sunshine. You need to go outside. You need to go for a walk. C-O-P, presence. You need to get in the presence of the Lord more than you have ever before. If you are going through a suffering, a two-minute Bible study in, and a quick little 30-second prayer is not going to cut it. You need to be in 
the presence of the Lord in the midst of suffering. And then C-O-P-E, community, outdoors, presence, exercise. <laughs> exercise. Listen, the moment you start getting your endorphins up, it starts to change the game. The moment you start to stretch a little bit and feel that burn to touch your toe, it changes the game. It changes the game. So you need to, in the midst of suffering, we all need to cope. Corny, C-O-P-E. You need to cope in the midst of this. Um, that's a great question. Um, all right, let's move on to the next one. Um, there is a difference between the Holy, is there a difference between the Holy Spirit and a person's conscience? I think that's a great question. Um, listen to these words in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 18, verse 20 says this. I put this charge before you, Timothy, my child, in keeping with the prophecies once spoken about you, in order that with such encouragement you may fight the good fight. To do this, you must, so how do we fight the good fight? How do we live the Christian life? To do this, you must hold firmly to faith and a good conscience which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwrecks in regards to the faith. Among them is Hymernanus and Alexander, who I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. It seems that Paul is saying to Timothy, his child of the faith, that for a Christian to stay on track and not to shipwreck their faith, they need one, a firm foundation in true gospel faith and two they also need a good conscience so to simply answer your question is there a difference between the holy spirit and a good conscience or a conscience yes simple but just because paul tells you need both doesn't mean you need to follow your conscience every time um, because it doesn't mean it's the right response because some of our conscience some of your consciences conscience isn't a good conscience why because your conscience is your consciousness of what you believe is right and wrong not what is actually right and wrong let me make this very clear the voice in your head is not necessarily god's voice this is why Paul stresses a good conscience, one that is managed by the Holy Spirit and submissive to the Word of God. And the way I see it, your conscience is like a gun scope. A few years back, my dad bought a pellet gun for my kids, put a really nice scope on it. He wanted to teach them how to shoot. And we spent a few uh, minutes to about an hour dialing in the scope. And if anyone's ever dialed in a scope, you steady it, you have your target, you shoot it, and you see, oh, it's too far to the right. Turn it a little bit. Shoot it again. Oh, it's a little bit more. Dial it again. Shoot it and do those things. That is your conscience, ladies and gentlemen. Meaning um, the church, uh, so how then do we, or what is the target in which our conscience is shooting for? Christ. Our conscience should be comparable to the image of Christ. How do we hit the mark? Through the Word of God. You can't just follow your heart, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible tells us the heart is wicked above all things. Jeremiah 17. So daily, we must tune in our conscience. We must align it to the Word of God, and then when it is aligned to the Word of God, then we can trust this is a daily struggle of being sanctified. This is the, uh, the Christian life is not for the faint of heart. It takes holy sweat, daily sacrificing ourselves to look more like Christ. And, and I would conclude for mamas out there and daddies out there with young children, it also really helps that you spank their butts. <laughs> Just a recommendation. Um, that's a, not in my notes. I don't have any time to go any further, but that would be my recommendation because we have a fun question up next. Uh, great question. All right. 
Next question. As Christ followers, what is the most respectful way to handle an interaction with the members of the LGBTQ community or becoming friends with someone that is LGBTQ? This is a great question and probably one of the most pressing questions the Church of America needs to be asking. With the rise of gender identity, seemingly, it is seemingly taking over every conversation in our culture right now. The church needs to address these questions from a biblical stance. So let me be very clear first as your pastor. Homophobia, any fear towards the LBGTQ community, is sinful and should be killed with inside the church. Now, nowadays, that's a loaded question, right? So let me clarify. Homophobia is the fear of a homosexuality and more specifically, homosexual people. And while it is not the same as loving and biblically, uh, a loving and a biblical opposition to certain behaviors or beliefs, this fear-based attitude often leads to unhelpful stereotypes, prejudice, and even cruel mistreatment. There is a difference between hate speech and biblical speech, ladies and gentlemen. But for mi too many times, because of our Christian sin, biblical speech quickly becomes hate speech. Currently, our world is trying to merge hate speech and biblical speech into the same category, and they are not the same category. This is where the church needs to stand up and draw clear lines between sinfulness and fearful hate and a loving God and biblical truth. How do we do this? By proclaiming biblical truth towards all sin, not just sin that makes you uncomfortable. The truth is sin is sin. Temptation is temptation. And men who have sex with men is listed right alongside greed, drunkenness, deception, slander, and all are worthy of exclusion from the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. The church in America has done a poor job of dealing with sin. I spoke about this in week one. But how do we, or how do I answer your question? I'm going to answer your question in two points. First one, how do we, um, the, the main question is, how do we respectfully handle an interaction with a person? I would say this, it might not be possible. The gospel is offensive. Scripture tells us this. And you can biblically love, you can biblically share the gospel truth, you can serve, and you can sacrifice for them. And in the end, the ungodly loves darkness and hates the light. This is found in John 3, 19 and 20. But their reaction does not give you a pass on biblical love, first and foremost. Number two, we need to be able to cross the aisle, church, and listen with gospel ears, then speak from a gospel heart. Having worked in the service industry for over a decade, I was surrounded with opportunities and I made a decision. I could build bridges or I could build walls. We have to, uh, we have believed a lie that listening is in some aspect agreeing. That is not the case. Proverbs 18.13 Proverbs 18, 13. Proverbs 18, 13. Go home and look it up. We're not agreeing with their sinful lifestyle. We are prayerfully looking for God to give opportunities to share the truth. Too many Christians have walls up instead of gospel hands reached out. Should you and I have gay friends? Yes. Much like we should have friends who are single and sexually active. 
much like we should have friends who are alcoholics, much like we should have friends who are gossipers and friends who are greedy. But for us as believers, our prayer is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, those that he would use us and those who are in that lifestyle, those who are gossipers, alcoholics, sexually active, greedy, or any sin, our hope and our prayer should that they should not stay that way. That we should cross the aisle and lovingly listen with gospel ears and with a gospel heart so that we can speak the gospel into their lives so that they do not remain that way regardless of what the sin is. And for anyone who is far from God, each person should be taken um, not with generics but specifics. So I would encourage you, you need godly discernment and you need to pray through every relationship you come in contact with and maybe even challenge your heart a little bit. Maybe the reason why you're good with being friends with an alcoholic who talks inappropriately at work, maybe a person who does this or does that, but you're not okay with a person who has an alternative lifestyle is because your heart isn't gospel-centered in this area. We're not giving a pass on the sin. What we're doing is we're challenging the sin in our hearts first. Ladies and gentlemen, the church has to do a better job of loving, not accepting, the, uh, uh, um, not accepting ungodly lifestyles, but biblically crossing the aisle so that Jesus can use us to witness in dark areas. This is the best I can answer all of these questions in the midst of this time restraints. Uh, let me address the last question because I have to get you guys out of here. And court, you can come down whenever you want. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. I would like a better understanding of this verse. That should be the last question. Uh, go back for me, guys. That's Yeah, right there. Leave it right there for a second. Um, this is a great question. Um, the section of Scripture is dealing with our Christian works and the rewards from them that we will receive in heaven. So the Bible talks about this. You and I get heaven, but also because of our Christian works, we will receive rewards in heaven. In court, you can come down. Um, we all know that our Christian works do not save us. The book of Romans states, by the works of the law, no human being uh, will be justified in his sight. That's Romans 3.20. And we hold that the one is justified by faith apart from his works of the law. We see this in Romans 3.28. Church, none of your works, none of your obedience is the ground for our salvation and our justification. That is clear. It never could be. We are never good enough. Our, our actions apart from Christ will always be contaminated. You must have Christ to be saved period. But our Christian works do result into, in rewards in our afterlife. Look at the verse in context. It says this, um, 1 Corinthians 3, let's start in 11. For no one can lay any foundation other than what is being laid, which is Jesus Christ, period. Jesus Christ is the foundation. If anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, Precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. These are um, understandings of or interpretations of our different types of works. Each builder will be plainly seen for the day. That's why it's capital, meaning the day of his return. will make it clear because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what kind of work each has done. If what someone has built survives, he will be, receive his reward or receives a reward. Now verse 15, if someone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only through fire. This passage lays out that our Christian service will be weighed, ladies and gentlemen, counted and seen if it's worthy. Meaning, what is your motive 
behind your Christian service? What is your motive behind serving? Is it to prop up self or is it to prop up Christ? Last night, my eight-year-old, you're sitting in Carly's room, my, my 12-year-old, and, and Carly goes, or London goes, hey, can we, can we pick up the neighbor? Some neighborhood kids moved in next to us and they've been playing with them this whole week. And, and she goes, hey, can we pick them up and can we bring them to church with us? It's a great thing. It's a great question. I was excited about that. And we started to dive in a little bit more with, Car, uh, with London. Come to find out the reason why she wants them to come is because she wants friends inside the kids' ministry. And I said, honey, so the only reason you want them to come to church is so that you have more friends in the kids' ministry? And she goes, well, you put it like that, Dad. I was like, the goal shouldn't be for you to have more friends. The goal for us to bring them to church is for them to hear the gospel, believe it in their hearts, and repent and be saved. See, she said good things. My eight-year-old said good things. Let's bring people to church. She did it from selfish motives, ladies and gentlemen. Not the same thing. I don't have time to unpack this even more, but I do want to say this. This is something the church doesn't talk about enough. As I was studying for this question, it really hit me on how important this topic is for our sanctification and how we live here on earth. It also aligns with how I drastically feel God is leading us in 2024. So much like the pastor question, what should a pastor be, that we asked last week, I'm going to dedicate an entire week, uh, or an, an entire Sunday to this topic the first week of January. I cannot encourage you enough. I leave this week to go off and plan next year. I cannot encourage you enough already what God is stirring in my heart. Do not miss a week in January. I can beg you as your pastor, don't miss a week in January. Every single week, every single Sunday will be important to pointing us to the direction God is leading us in 2024. Something I truly believe God is shaping for you and I, our holiness and our good. So you need to be here every month or every week of January. Be here every month as well. Um, but that is my time. I am completely out of time. Uh, this has been a challenging series. I know a thousand more questions have been asked. And I hope those questions will push you closer to Jesus, not farther away. 